In our last session, we were looking at how Jesus paid tribute to his cousin, John the Immerser, as being the greatest man ever to have been born of a woman, and that he was that prophetic figure, the forerunner, prophesied in the book of Malachi, the Elijah-like figure, if you will, who was to prepare the way for the Lord. I want us to review again the things that Jesus said, but this time from Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 7, verse number 28. Luke 7, 28. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So even though John is like the super prophet of all time, the people who have more information about Jesus and about salvation in his name, they are better off than even the super prophet John was. Uh, But I want you to zero in on a little parenthetical commentary from Luke. Remember Luke, when he writes his gospel, he tries to explain some things along the way to Theophilus and by extension anyone else reading this gospel. So verse number 29, he says, when all the people heard this and the tax collectors too, they declared God just or fair, having been immersed with the immersion of John. So the people were glad to hear that Jesus upheld John as the greatest man ever been born, the greatest prophet ever to have come, because they had obeyed John's message of repent, prepare for the kingdom, and they'd been immersed in the waters of the Jordan River and had their sins washed away and uh, started fresh in a new righteous life. But, Luke goes on to say, the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been immersed by him. And so this is the passage that I've used to show that when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out Uh, to see John uh, in one of the other Gospels, it wasn't for them to be immersed. It was for them to come and check him out and then reject the idea of being immersed by him because immersion was connected to the idea, I've got a problem and I need to repent of it. I need to start fresh. And they didn't believe that of themselves. So they'd rejected John's ministry which prompts Jesus now to critique the attitude of the rejectors. Verse 31, To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? Well, they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, you didn't weep. So these are kids that are First, coming up with the idea, let's all play fu- uh, let's all play wedding. Let's all have happy music and dance and sing and laugh. But some of the other kids were just sitting around going, no, I don't want to do it that way. And so the kids decide, okay, we'll change it over. Uh, since you seem to be in a bad mood, we'll play funeral instead. We'll all sit around and sing little sad songs and and cry and and just make our faces look really, really uh, horribly sad. But they don't want to do that either. And so the application that Jesus uses is this. For John the Immerser came eating no bread and drinking no wine. So John came along. He was aesthetic. Uh, He limited what he did, because he'd been placed under a Nazarite vow uh, at conception. So he only ate a very limited amount of foods, and he drank no alcoholic beverages, including no wine at all. 
uh, not even grape juice, uh, unfermented wine. And so uh, when John is living by that sort of restricted lifestyle, the Pharisees, who did not live by that type of restricted lifestyle, they said, he has a demon. So they rejected him, thinking he's got something wrong with him. Um, Verse 34, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. So Jesus is not under a Nazarite vow. He is not limited in uh, his restriction of alcoholic beverages, including wine. In fact, he his very first miracle was making water into wine. And so he is actually participating in normal Jewish society, eating and drinking. And so they turn around and say, look, look at him. He's a glutton and he's a drunkard. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So they accuse him of being wild and crazy. So John's too restricted. Jesus is too wild and crazy. And uh, the whole point is that it's the hearts of the rejectors that's the problem. And so Jesus then throws this proverb out, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. Uh, So you can tell what a person's real attitude is by what they do. And so these attitude, the people's attitude, these Pharisees' attitude is, we don't want to do things the way that God wants us to do it. Now, they don't express it that way. It's basically, no, nah, John the Immerser is not a representative of what God wants for us. We don't need to repent. We don't need to be immersed. And neither is Jesus. He's not a representative of what God wants for us. We don't have to... Uh, have a righteousness that surpasses the current things that we're doing right now in order to enter the kingdom, we're good to go. And so Jesus says, the problem is you, and it's demonstrated by what you're doing. Uh, Remember, he uses a term for them, hypocrites, hypocrites, which was the common word for a play actor, a stage actor, somebody who played a part, put on a role, wore a mask on the stage to express uh, whatever the script was trying to express. So Jesus has just slammed these guys again to let them know that they're not doing things the way God wants them done. At this point, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 11 which is just the follow-up to uh, the comments we just read. Verse number 20, where it says, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. So he starts naming the places that he's put so much time into. And yet, the people there, at least some of the people there, are writing him off. And the cities that he names are all in Galilee, and they form a triangle. Uh, They are Chorazin, which is just, I think it's less than two miles north of Capernaum. Uh, And then uh, Capernaum itself, which is right on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And then Bethsaida, And Bethsaida, Galilee, uh, is just a couple of miles west of Capernaum. And then that means that Chorazin is just a couple of miles north uh, from, uh, from Bethsaida. And so it forms a little triangle. And inside that triangle uh, is the hill upon which Jesus prayed all night Uh, before naming his disciples and then coming down toward the sea to a level place, he he preached his sermon on the mount. So this little triangle, uh, less than two miles on each side, uh, is where Jesus has been putting in a lot of his ministry efforts. And so he now preaches about them. 
Verse 21, Woe to you, Grazen! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So in Old Testament times, Tyre and Sidon had been targeted by God for the need that they should repent or face his wrath, face his judgment. And they didn't repent. And so they ended up being judged and going into ruins and being rebuilt over time. Uh, But Jesus says, if they'd had the benefit of my presence doing the miracles that I've done, they would have survived because they would have repented. Uh, But, verse 22, I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Because the problem is, Tyre and Sidon didn't have the Messiah right there in front of them doing these miracles. But Bethsaida and Chorazin did. So they have a higher responsibility and accountability. Verse 23, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? So you think you're so great? You will be brought down to Hades the place of the dead, the place of judgment. For if the mighty works done uh, in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah sit as one of the great examples from Old Testament scripture, from the book of Genesis of what happens if you don't repent, if you remain in your sin. God's judgment falls upon you, and you're obliterated from the scene. And yet Jesus says, Sodom might have been able to survive if they'd seen some of the signs and wonders that Capernaum had seen. And yet, people at Capernaum had rejected Jesus as Messiah. How is that even possible? And so Jesus uh, is just giving them fair warning uh, that they need to repent or face God's wrath. At this point, I want us to bring in an event that comes to us in the Scripture Uh, from Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee, hearing stories about Jesus' ministry and apparently the ministry of his 12 apostles and his 70 or 72 disciples in this time frame that we're talking about right now. Uh, Now, this... This is now closing to the tail end of the window of uh, the traveling around that Jesus and the 12 and the 70 or 72 have been doing. Uh, So we're coming very close to the uh, end of winter uh, and the beginning of spring that marks a new Jewish year. And this particular year will be 32 going in to, uh, excuse me, 31 going into 32 uh, AD. And so um, I want to read to you from, let's see, I think I want to read to you from Mark chapter number 6, verse 14. It says, King Herod heard of it. Uh, Now, what's he hearing about? Well, verse 13 said, that the apostles were out there casting out demons and anointing with oil many who were sick and healing them. So that tells us Herod has heard about all these miraculous things happening, not just with one person doing miracles, but with almost a hundred people doing miracles all over Galilee. And so King Herod hears of this and... uh, that Jesus' name had become known, 
And some were saying this, John the Immerser has been raised from the dead, and that's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Uh, because John is freshly dead as Jesus is finishing up this ministry tour, and the apostles and the disciples are finishing up their ministry tour. Uh, also, verse 15, others were saying, well, he's Elijah. Now, you can see how that might have also gotten started by Jesus saying, he is Elijah if you will accept it. Uh, but the uh, Jewish people were expecting that Elijah would show up to introduce the Messiah to the world. And so John the Immerser had introduced Jesus to the world. And so some people were wondering whether or not he it was Elijah. Uh, but now, now they're beginning to think that maybe Jesus is the Elijah figure. And others were saying he is he's a prophet like one of the prophets of old. So there's just rumors flying all over the place uh, as we're coming to the tail end of Jesus' second year of ministry. And Herod is taken aback by them all because of this. When Herod heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he'd married her. So you remember all of that? The reason John the Immerser was put into custody was because when he got wind that Herod Antipas and Herodias had divorced their legitimate spouses and married each other, John said, you guys need to repent of that. Because that was John's ministry, was to tell people they needed to repent. They needed to rethink their actions and do things God's way. And God's way is not divorcing your legitimate spouse and marrying someone else. So John had told them, you guys got to reverse that. And they didn't want to. In fact, uh, it got bad enough th uh, that uh, Herodias uh, and Herod decided that John needed to be taken out of circulation. So he's been cooling his heels in probably the fortress city of Machaerus on the east side of the Dead Sea for the last almost a year. And now Herodias has just about had enough of John even being alive. Um, verse 18, For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. So for the last year, John has been in custody, and Herodias has been steaming about it, because she wants him dead instead. But Herod... Herod Antipas is afraid to put him to death because the people hold John to be a prophet and he doesn't want to cause a scene, he doesn't want to cause a, a riot uh, by killing him. But also, he's kind of afraid of him because he is a prophet and he, con he converses with him from time to time and he always feels really scared by those conversations but he always wants to do it again because he is a prophet. He is a powerful person. Uh, so that's what's been going on for about the last year. And then Herodias seizes an opportunity to get rid of John. And this is the way that Mark tells the story. It's also told in Matthew and Luke. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday... Now, we do not have a historical record of the date of Herod's birthday, but it must be in the wintertime because this story has to take place in the latter part of the winter uh, that spanned 31 
going into 32. So an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. Now, this is a little bit strange because the festivities are not taking place in Galilee. Herod is the tetrarch of Galilee up in the north, but he's also tetrarch of Perea, which is down in the south. Perea is actually the eastern side of the lower Jordan Valley, as well as the northern part of the eastern shore of the Dead Sea. Uh, And this area uh, is the place uh, that stays pretty warm in the winter months, and it was not uncommon for those that had uh, the resources to have a winter home in the lower Jordan Valley, or in the case of Herod, along the um, heights of the western shore, or the eastern shore of the Dead Sea. Uh, a, a winter palace, if you will. So it would seem, it would appear, that Herod has gone to Machaerus for the winter months of 31 going into 32. And while he's there, his birthday happens. And he invites all of the bigwigs to travel a few days down uh, from Galilee to Perea and join him for the festivities of his birthday. And... uh, At his birthday party, his birthday dinner, this happens. Verse 22. When Herodias' daughter came in and danced. Now, her name is Salome. She is Herod's niece. And I object greatly (laughs) to all of the portrayals of her dance being uh, some sort of salacious dance. Uh, to rouse uh, the sexual lust of her uncle. Uh, We don't know her age at this time. She seems to probably be a teenager of some sort. Uh, But it appears to be just a a sort of dance that would be appropriate for mixed company at a birthday party where there's mothers and fathers and there might even be some other kids in there as well. So she gets up and she dances in celebration of her uncle Herod, Antipas' birthday. And she pleased Herod and his guests. See that there? It's not just Herod. The others loved her performance. I don't know if she did a modern dance or she did ballet or whatever it was, but she did something that made everybody clap and applaud and be very happy. And so... The king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Now that might seem extravagant, but we have other examples where kings, tetrarchs, would designate large portions of their kingdom to... Uh, members of their family that would then rule that once they were dead. So effectively, he's telling her, you you tell me what you want, even to half my kingdom, and I will put you in my will. I will make sure you've got it. And so, now that she's got that promise, she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask? And so, she checks in with mom uh, to make a wise choice. Should I ask for this city, that region? What should I ask for? Because this is a big ask. And this is where mom decides she can finally get what she's looking for. And so she uses her daughter. She said to her, the head of John the Immerser. That's what you need to ask for. And so, apparently, Salome goes along with this. I mean, after all, she seems to be a teenager, and her mom is a very 
powerful person in her own right. Uh, And so, verse 25, she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Immerser on a platter. Now, King Herod, Tetrarch Herod, Antipas, never expected this. He was expecting her to ask for some sort of special um, gifting in the king's will. And so the king was exceedingly sorry. He was sorry that now he was trapped by his oath. Uh, Because, I know this is going to sound weird, but Herod Antipas is Jewish. I mean, he believes in keeping the Jewish rules for the most part. And that includes when you make a promise in the name of the Lord, you keep it. And so, because of his oaths, so he swore in the name of God, apparently, that he would give her whatever she asked. Because of his oaths and his guests, because they witnessed his oaths, so he can't go back on it, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately, the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. So now we have this bloody end to the greatest prophet ever born of woman. He has his head chopped off, probably because he's a Roman citizen, by the way, and it is now being gifted to this dance girl, who gifted it to her mom. And when we come back in our next session, we will follow up on what verse 29 tells us. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And then they went and told Jesus about it. See you next session.